Hey, 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 what is going on, COD Familia? It is your boy BN, aka Mr. Kingdom Builder, and we are back again for episode 8 now, which I just had to ask Sneak about because I wasn't sure which number we were on. But we are back with another episode here of the COD Pod, as always, with me as my favorite co-host, and more or less probably only consistent co-host, which has been great to have thus far. We got our guy, Mr. Sneak. Mr. Sneaky, how we doing? I am good, man. It's been a very exciting day. I've just come off a four hour stream so hopefully we're going to get some of the guys from the channel coming in and joining in the podcast it's just gonna be really fun so any questions put them in chat i'm gonna try and answer them throughout the podcast for us all oh yeah man as as always and again hopefully we'll have some moments here where we can be a little interactive or at least as much as possible i have to keep the chat window open that's probably what i should do but which will be a lot better for us yeah, <laughs> that's great. Uh, so, okay, so we, we got a few things we want to talk about today. Uh, one, obviously, we want to talk about the patch notes for 1.0.16, along with something interesting that you and I were just touching on a bit, which is some of the migration impact. And obviously, with SS1 2 uh, specifically going through their first migration, and SS1 3 just finished theirs, and we got SS1 4 that's going to be coming up next. There's some interesting things that happen, and you obviously have a little bit more insight because you play a main account on one of those kingdoms. But before we even get there, let's touch on the update. Now, obviously, in point one six, there is a, there's a healthy, let's say that, amount mm -hmm. of changes and things that are coming our way to COD. And it, it is very interesting because, again, I covered this, you covered this. And so let me just start with you. Again, let's kind of do... What do you like about the update? Give me just two or three things that you like about the update that you think are hopefully going to be good directions that the game's going to go in. Um, well, one of them straight away was the reduced difficulty in the Crucible of Courage. Like, that has been one thing every player has been screaming for, which is really good to see. So, like, I'm happy at the fact that, you know, the players have put feedback in the Discord telling you know the devs like look at this this is like ridiculous we were going against a raid boss for for a head and then now they've realized it is a little bit too difficult so they've hopefully tweaked the end game or later you know levels of that event so that was a really good change i like since it's not even though it might not be a big change it's more of you know it's a change that the devs are showcasing like look we are willing to work with you and we're willing to listen which is really good um Obviously, for me, it's the two, like my biggest thing is the two legendary heroes for obvious reasons, right? Um, those two legendary heroes come in, and they look amazing. <laughs> Can we just say, like, the, the picture the Call of Dragons guys have put out on the official Facebook page looks amazing? Mm -hmm. Um, we are we were talking about it on stream, which is really cool. Um, with the chat, we were always wondering basically how strong this Sindrion guy is going to be or sin i don't know how we're going to call him but i think it's Sindrion. um he's a marksman rally and precision so a lot of the debate about that hero was all about is he actually going to have almost like four pvp talents and then have the rally tree or are they going to go with the generic three skills and then like <clears throat> one of them is a rally dedicated you know like skill yeah. um and they like were saying ask. yeah so they were saying if he's got a dedicated rally skill they're actually gonna feel like he might still be strong but because he has that rally skill it's gonna impact his you know actual meta shifting hopefully you know defining role so we'll soon see um when that comes in and obviously they've got the two new artifacts so uh, I like all the new things, as you can tell. Um, but <laughs> the last thing that I think you'll probably like as well, or I think was the most actually like interesting thing that caught me off guard, were the talent change to Garrison and Rally. The fact that you can now say, um, I want a fair offense or fair defense and force your opponent into not using their skill one for so many seconds or maybe for the duration of the fight i've not understood exactly maybe how this talent works but it's such a cool like concept that you can be like okay i know you have maybe a better skill one but maybe my march is better pound for pound like hit for hit better than yours but 
because of the debuffs that you you know bring to the table i can disable that so i'm really interested in as well that aspect so that's like the three points so far in patch 1.016 that i've i've been really loving and it's caught my attention the most so far okay okay I mean, solid, man. Solid. I think for me, I will go with the things that I like. Obviously, you know, I'm always big on quality of life things, and I like the alliance change that's coming. One of those specifically being being able to see the daily changes in member power on the personal rankings and with the merit changes as well. More so on the power, really, than the merits. I think the merit, well, let me say this I think the merits are good if you're talking season two right or season one plus or as we can just call it the merged kingdom right yeah. i think that is where the mer merit rankings are going to be a lot better because it'll be able to show you and we don't know what it's going to be is it going to be a plus minus thing where it'll show you what the week before was on monday and then and then what's the plus minus change for the next week on monday will it be a daily change like we don't really know what that how intricate it's going to be but i do like the idea of having some way to gauge more so of your PVP activity without having to do as much um, data input where you'd have to go in the spreadsheet and do it on Monday and then do it the next day and cap it. I mean, maybe you'll still do that, but at least you'll be able to see what the plus minus gains are, or at least I hope, right? And again, we don't know how it's going to be, but I just think having that there can help a little bit when it comes to when you're kind of all out fighting and you can see however those changes will be presented. And I think with the, with the member power, I think that will help a little bit more if not a lot when it comes to season one and, and continuous and continuously because then you'll be able to gauge at least fact use that as a factor to, to talk about general player activity on well hey these player these players are have only gained a thousand power in three days okay well they're probably not that active and you know they haven't posted that they're going to be away they haven't posted in some type of a time off group chat so right that makes it a little bit more easy to say okay well we'll remove this these players we'll just message them and let them know and then or you see people that are gaining you know tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of power um over days or over a week so i just like that it's a little bit more hands-on now you're seeing alliances get a little bit more utility and being able to have more support for the way that they're being managed and the way that you're engaging activity. And that was obviously something that a lot of people from the community really wanted to see too as well, that we saw not only from the dev feedback column, but also for a lot of suggestions that were coming around in the, around that time. And then I guess the last one for me would most likely have to be the, oh gosh, I think it's this collision one yeah. that I like which is where they're disabling the intercept mode and the pass modes and they're adding collision between legions so it's what it says is non-friendly legions will collide with each other when yeah. not in battle making it impossible for them to pass through each other the, the reason i kind of like this is because one <clears throat> i do kind of feel like it's a little bit more realistic and then two i like the idea that you could actually block off choke points with this mechanic now once it does come in. Because you could have... There's fights where you'll see them going through a choke point on a zone 3. Right? If you're building from the northwest, you have to come down that bridge and then kind of go through that choke point if you want to go southwest around the corner, around that south southern mountain range in Atherin. And so, like, that's an example of where you could put five or six units and bait and you know and, and again obviously they're not going to last forever but if you have enough units you could almost kind of form a wall if you will right where they can't go through you can even use that to cut people off and block them from retreating if you have people that are already deeper you could almost use that as a way to buy yourself time or delay for other units to catch up uh, so I, I just I think there's multiple uses for it, and I guess I just like the idea that they're going a little bit more realistic. We'll have to see how it plays out and how the data, you know, yeah. view, uh, looks as well from a few. But I like the concept, at least behind them testing something that doesn't seem incredibly harmful to the game or really at all, but it could be interesting in, in how it plays out. And then I think that just tied in with the intercept mode and the password options. I I mean, you know, my feeling on you know really how I'd like to see PvP, which is that uh, my view is that no unit should be attacking unless that unit is clicked on and then starts attacking and that's that's how i'm always going to feel about that yeah so, uh, the way the way i like i like it the whole thing they've done because the way they've done it is they've basically like put intercept mode into the game without you having to physically click it and like the only way 
physically intercept triggers where combat occurs is if you were red nameplate, so meaning you are yeah. aggressive, which makes sense. So then if there's just two whites that are crossing paths, then it's going to just like hit each other or they might maybe maneuver around each other, right? And they might just walk around each other instead. Um, yeah. But I do like it because like you said, you know, it to me, it give infantry again more of a defining role because it's kind of like, mm -hmm. look, my, my <clears throat> job is to be the front line for the back. So it's like I can now sit here, purposely block this area with all my infantry and let my mages and archer players have free reign unless obviously they get caught out by the flying units of some sort you know yep. but it's really good that you can see them adding dynamic play and i think the more you you see in it a really good description was actually chisgo because chisgo said um he feels like sometimes you're playing a moba and i was like that's literally how i feel like when i'm playing it like you <laughs> are almost playing like a moba you've got these marches that you're micromanaging completely different to rock but then you've got this artifact that's almost like an ultimate ability that you're trying to use as a time window and benefit from. So it's a really good concept that I think they're slowly adding on. So I do, I really like that change as well. I think it's one of the better changes they've added in the patch. No, yeah. and I, you know, I think to your point, I think one thing that comes to mind to me, right, is something that we usually see in open field fights, which is often see Cav trying to flank. Uh, whether that's for archers or single units that are kind of just poking or sticking out a little bit overextended. And to your point about the infantry being able to maneuver, right, that's something that they can now do a little bit more. Or you can even have cav on cav, right, that the cav stops yeah. another cav unit from uh, immediately going forward. They have to go around that unit if they collide. Same thing with infantry. You could almost put like a little wall up around your archers or your DPS, right? which is usually something you see, again, in League and in other MOBA games where you're kind of trying to protect your DPS a little bit more so they can sustain throughout a fight, so they can output as much damage as possible. So I almost wonder if those things will become, you know, just maybe little instances or little scenarios that we'll see play out because of it. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Now let's talk about maybe some of your dislikes, <laughs> or maybe, or maybe just it's, some things that you question. Right? Is there is there even been, is there just anything you're on the fence about? One. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, hit me with it. Okay. I, I have one or two. So okay. Go. The, the number one. Why are you limiting how I level? <laughs> oh. That's the best way of putting it. Why are you limiting the way players get to level the game? I find it absolutely ridiculous. The fact that. A player now has to fight PvP combat to get from level 50 plus. And the way, which is more mind-boggling to me, right? And I think you would now even understand it. So imagine you're playing a new character. It's level one. We farm or do whatever we do to level 20 or 30, right? But what if we get into a small fight? So we get into a small fight now and we might have just gone from level 30 to 35. So we've used five levels now. So when we hit fifth there, does that mean I still get to go to 55 with farming? Or does that mean I'm still locked at 50? Because if that's the case... Ah, uh, I see what you mean. If that's the case, I have to now mid-max my leveling to be as much into, you know, farming and using XP <clears throat> books to then make sure the last little punch is all PvP based. So I really yeah. hate how they've done that. And I just, like, dislike generally the whole xp change even the fact that like epic heroes now only have five stars while legendaries have six stars makes no sense to me like they both should have six star <laughs> capabilities like yeah. why are you making a clear differential between epics and legendaries there already is one nope. What's funny is, this, so like, that's how it was. If you remember before the update they did where they reduced the stars for season one, before the, you yeah. got the stars unlocked in the future season, that's how it was when we were in beta. It's just, it just, everyone had six. It was just, why, why, why are you making it just five and six? Just everyone have six, because then it's, it's, it yeah. makes sense, right? So it, yeah. it's a really wild thing to me that uh, the devs are changing star levels on heroes and making a bigger difference and differential between epics and legendaries like it makes no sense and the fact that they're limiting players on how you should be able to level up in the game is just beyond crazy to me like if anything like i said 
they should be adding new ways to gain XP. We've got engineering heroes. Why can't engineering heroes get XP for building roads, building flags, destroying flags? We've got gathering heroes that are able to do gathering tasks and gain XP. Mm -hmm. You're limiting ways to gain XP, but you're not expanding on the current heroes you've got. It's just so crazy to me. So as you can tell, I hate that. That point is so backwards. <laughs> I'm very no. Passionate. I mean, listen. Um, no. I, I'm. I'm. I definitely. So above all else, uh, again, if if I had to check above all for everything you said, I, I effortlessly would. I think the gathering point is pretty spot on, right? If you're getting exp for gathering, why aren't you getting exp for some of those other areas? Especially because I mean, if you think about when you're starting out in the beginning uh, with an alliance, one of the challenges often is getting people to show up to build. Not only for flags, for forts, for roads, you know, you you, you don't usually see, a, I mean, you, you have more people that show up on a, on a regular basis probably to do a behemoth than you're going to get that same amount of people consistently over every single flag that you're going to build to build a flag. So why not incentivize uh, more participation within an alliance by allowing for you to get EXP from building now you can maybe make the argument that okay if you want to do that maybe you know then you have to kind of debate on okay well is it going to be the same amount of xp that you'll get for gathering would it be a little bit less if you're building would they proportion it right however they do that i still think it's a good point i still think it's something worth trying and then yeah i mean, I mean again the levels the yeah the level 60 thing for me is just <clears throat> is is beyond redonkulous um and that's just saying it nicely did you notice how if you're reading the change in two, where it's new season, new experiences, and you scroll down about a little more than halfway, and it talks about the changes uh, they're making to the way the heroes gain EXP with the talents Earth's Grace. Yeah, I didn't and... know exactly what the percentage change is. Is it are they changing it up, increase <laughs> or decrease? In it? Yeah. So, so listen, if you read it, read both lines, and it says when a legion finishes gathering resources. The other one says when a legion finishes gathering resources, and then they updated it. So the one that they put out 13 hours ago actually has text wording changes because I, I that was just something I pointed to. They were basically the same thing. The only difference was is one of them said 0.4 up to up to 2.0% or 2%, and the other one said just 2% flat. It was super funny, right? Oh. And but now you see there is a difference, right? Now it says the hero, right? Before it was the hero receives exp equal to, um, and then after it's the gathering hero receives oh, right and that was so, they took so now it's only to them exactly oh. so now it's only the get because before like even if you gather now you may and you've noticed this as much as as much as others have which is when you gather with a gathering hero if you have a non-gathering hero as your secondary sometimes the secondary will get the exp yeah. and sometimes they won't and so now it feels like they're changing it completely to where only the gathering hero will get the exp and no one else will so you know, basically kind of wild. limiting your opportunity. Yeah, so it's just... I, but to your point, it feels to me, and this is something that I talked about in the video I did, which is that it seems like they're trying to slow down the progression a bit. Like the development of account progression by doing some of these changes. And even more, like, just talking about the fact that they're that they're limiting the stars, right? I mean, think about how many epic purple commanders are used regularly mm -hmm. in PvP rock. Yep. Right, you don't see you don't see epic commanders and rock becoming obsolete, and this is interesting to me because now it gives me the impression. Well, because the way I look is like this: if you're going to change it like that, clearly you're uh, you're uh, nerfing the the epic heroes a bit by removing a star from them. And if that's the case, are you now going to go in a direction where you're going to pump out more legendary heroes than you are epics? Are you going to not pump out any more epics and only do legendaries? Because, I mean, it, it could end up being pretty disparaging, the difference. Yep. And obviously, we won't know until it happens. But part of me wonders if by doing this change, will players going forward now not care to level epic heroes for PvP? Will they only focus on legendaries because they know they won't be able to get that six star? Does the six star not really matter to them at the end of the day? Because if you just generally think about how long it takes to max out a hero anyways throughout a season, it it's just... Yeah, no, I still think it does because the thing is, you got to remember, so the difference in Rock, so Rock, right, it, 
if, if it was the same system as Rock, I could get behind it, right? Because it was like, if I think, is it in Rock where if you go up to the extra stars, that's when you get extra talent points, right? So you're able to unlock yeah. more stuff, which makes, that's fine. Um, yeah. Obviously, for an epic being five stars, that makes sense. But again, being five stars, it wouldn't harm him if it was only extra talent points because they could be the deputy, right? So you could still yeah. have a reason to do that. But the fact that the, f the fifth star is a PvP increment and the sixth star is also a PvP increment, that's the problem. It's the fact that each star is giving you either one of them's giving you physical attack against the target and then the other one's giving you some sort of damage reduction. So it's like yeah. you're you're losing out on some sort of PvP stat which matters. So it's like, it, it's crazy to me that this, they're not allowing, like say, like epics to have it because you should be able to have those stats on those commanders to make it as fair as possible. So maybe they go back on it. Oh, well, I say go back. Maybe they just be like, look, we messed up. He has six stars and they give everyone like a bunch of stars, <laughs> you know, just to level up yeah. a hero to six star at least. But it is... It is so crazy how they're trying to create such a big disparity between... Because you are right, I think if it gets that point, I would only probably level up maybe two epic commanders, which would be Waldir and, and Guan, that would be it. Or maybe yeah. Waldir and Craig. And that literally, there would be a, there'd only be two epics each season that I'd be leveling up, and that'd be them <clears> two every time. So I hope they don't like do that, but we'll see you guys. <laughs> Man, dude, that no, I mean that that that's the absolute truth. Um, yeah, it's gonna be our okay. How about how about give me how about give me one or two interesting things? Uh, anything else that you that you liked that's coming in the update that you think could be impactful in any way at this point? Let's let's maybe just open it up a bit more. Yeah. I mean, I think there's one or two I have, but anything anything you the have one, outside of what you already mentioned? Yeah, the well, the last thing for me to the wards, the patch, which. Is a bit of an iffy one again for me is the the city themes because I do obviously <laughs> love city themes. Don't get me wrong, I love everyone loves to make the skin like the city look sick. Like if you don't, you're lying to yourself. I don't care who you are, right? But yeah. the problem which I'm kind of having with this yeah. city theme is I don't mind obviously if it's uh you know like they've put it's a a reward based you know power ranking event that's fine um the, the only thing i have a problem with is if it's gonna have stats because if it has stats they need to make well. yeah if it has stats it needs to have almost like generic stats for the start if that makes sense so like it needs to maybe have or even if they just say like legion right so if they just say like it yeah. gets legion attack or legion hp because then it works for or like all. gathering or peacekeeping yeah so then at least it gives every heat you know troop type that that buff they can't bring out a city skin that's like infantry health 15 percent because it's like hey no let's become infantry meta you know so they can't do anything crazy like that so i'm a bit scared <laughs> but i'm excited as well because i kind of obviously like anyone they love skins so okay i got a good one for you get ready for this what about the semi-protected passes is this... I, don't, I don't know if you i don't know if you read i don't know if you yeah. read this part that detailed so this is interesting to me because they didn't give a lot of detail on it but what it says it says new pass mode semi-protected passes can only be attacked by alliances who have occupied a behemoth lair within the pass's region, changing the pace at which the map opens up and protecting your affiliated region. So this to me makes it seem like if you're in if you're in Kaltia, as an example, and you want to try and get to Nivola, you have to go through Sophrastia. The way I'm reading this is that you would have to capture a you would have to capture a behemoth in Sephrastia and then flag all the way up north before you can cap a pass. So it's it's basically yeah, the same system. Is, yeah. all, all they did was just all they did was just say you have to cap a behemoth now as a prerequisite before you could take the pass. Yeah. Right? Because before right now you could flag all the way to the pass and take the pass. 
but they're saying now you have to at least capture a behemoth. So they, they essentially added one thing. But the interesting part to me is is basically kind of still what 65 did in its like first fight within the kingdom is basically just having a, a player's hop from alliances. Like there's obviously other ways to get to other regions, but by doing it from your own alliance. I mean, again, I don't see this as a, a super impactful thing. You could basically take it while you're flagging up in that direction. But I guess I'm curious on your thoughts on if one, because bear in mind, the last update or the second last update was the biggest change thus far to the way that Zone 1 regions operate, where you can now not move your CF, you're limited to where you are, and you basically have to flag out all the way to other Zone 1 regions. This was something that Steelheart, our boy Chad Thunder Broski, ended up saying, and I, I point out to it because he was one of the big proponents for it early on in the beta, was wanting to see this type of change happen where it, there wasn't as much fluid movement within Zone 1. So I guess I'm curious, if we're looking at this for New Kingdoms, do you like the semi-protected pass change, even though it is a kind of a small prerequisite? Uh, yeah, I guess, because it obviously means at least everyone gets a, I guess, fair zone one. Because um, the way I looked at the patch, oh well, the way I read it, I almost set, set, read it as like, so if I was in Sofrosty and I technically caught these passes now, so it's to my left or to my right, um, so Sofrosty Alliance's controlled them then basically the alliances on the other side couldn't couldn't get through anymore because obviously i've got control so for them to fight they'd have to almost go into like zone two and then push in from zone two into zone one to take over yeah so it was like a really long detour so i was like it makes sense i like it um obviously it's going to be some people might not like it because obviously some people might just want to fight straight away, which is it's understandable. But at the same time, what people don't realize is, and it's funny when you see it in the comments, you know, and you know what I'm going to say, but everyone thinks the game's a sprint <laughs> and it's not a sprint. It's a nice marathon. It's, it's all about long time pacing. And that's what I try and always keep pushing forward for you guys to learn about. So it's like... <laughs> It's a good. It's obviously a good step in the right direction because again, like you know, it would have allowed, for example, even in Server sixty five, you know, if this was implemented, a lot of a lot of project alliances to technically grow first before they could ha anything happened, you know, and even in future projects or um, in future seasons, it means any sort of merge or when the, f the season resets and you go into a new division for the first time, it means at least you know for the first week two weeks you know three weeks you might be safe you know and you can at least get a good scope of the field of what you're fighting against so it, it's a good change um obviously we're going to see it implemented right and then we're going to see how much of an effect it will have because as you know if anyone's going to learn to abuse it, it most likely will be t ta and ss1 because they've, <laughs> they've been the masters of being able to figure out a patch and work out how to abuse it so We'll soon see if it's gonna be good or if it's if it's not. So, oh, excuse me. No, nah, man. Listen, I'm with you. And what's interesting to me is, <clears throat> before we transition, one of the things that I always felt was really, really, really curious is that one of the things that the developers came out with early on, right, is kind of talking about how they wanted this game to be a little bit more alliance-focused and not necessarily kingdom-focused. And then you started hearing a lot of people complaining about... Uh, complaining, but more so giving constructive feedback on how there was just it was just too easy for an alliance to run through an entire kingdom in Zone 1 and just kind of do whatever they want. I mean, I think TA is a good example of going from, and you could make the argument TA and, uh, gosh, why, why am I, why am I forgetting? No, 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 no. In, in season two, I'm forgetting their name right now, uh, which is so bad. They, they started off in Kaltia and they were like the reason why they were, they factored into the reason why some of the members from Kaltia left and went to, uh, Forgotten Lands, I believe it was, and then restarted, or Zoland, I think it was, and restarted TN, forgetting their name. But <clears throat> the 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 situation basically in S2 was where you saw that alliance go from Kaltia and go all the way around the map to get to 
uh, Zoland, which I think they just ended up meeting in Forgotten Lands at that point, from what I remember. But being able to do that, where they just pass hopped all the way around through five regions or four regions. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting to me, and this is where I'm going with this, is that they they came out initially and said, we want the game to be a little bit more alliance-based. It's clear that they want... There, there was that, and we notice it with parts of updates that are coming out. It's clear that they're that they really want there to be a lot of PvP in the game. Which why wouldn't they? Because that will drive usually more sales and more money spent, and t- and typically more general investment within the game. So so there, there's small little updates here and there that are that are always telling us that. But then they come out with this type of an up. But then but then there's other parts of the updates that will limit how much. And I think. It's trying to find that happy medium, right? That nice middle ground of how do we create an environment where you can have as much PvP as you can in a fun way where people do not feel ostracized or they don't feel isolated in some way uh, to where they will not go out and do PvP, right? And this is something I, I just talked about today in the video I put out for 65 and talking about the DS situation, which was uh, a conversation that I, that, uh, I recorded from our diplomacy talks with ds and this was like one of the focal points right one of the golden questions is you know how do you play out a zone three where you can try and have you know the most amount of activity the most amount of engagement how can you have the the best and most fun pvp that can last as long as possible and not just a short three four five day stint and then you're kind of done at that point Right to where it's going to be enjoyable, um, and you can have it go as long as hopefully possible. And I think that's something that this type of a line item in the update really—I don't want to say qu- that I question, but I, I do wonder. That's where my curiosity is going. Is that you know it's like they say alliance based, but then they're coming out with things that are limiting the amount of early fighting that can happen. It's almost like they're telling you they want you to have as much fun and as much TP as you can, but they want to make it challenging early on but then get easier to do right once you get to zone two once you get to zone three especially because then you'll kind of have that but it is it is interesting that they're doing things that are proactively limiting some of it while in the same breath also doing things that will uh, allow right as far as what they're saying right kind of speaking to things so i don't know just just a very interesting thought yeah i get what you're saying um the way I see it with that is kind of, I don't know, I think Call of Dragons is kind of, is set up in a very PvP format. So even if the way they set it up now, right, where you can't technically hit anyone, say, from zo- any partner in Zone 1s, right, until you're in Zone 2, even then, what would happen, I can imagine, is like each of these zones are going to have their own alliances. And you got to imagine if these are alliances that aren't projects, right? Just a normal kingdom, just normal people playing, normal servers and alliances building up. You're going to now imagine it, and this is how I've always seen Call of Dragons. It's almost like the, it's like Darwin's project, you know, it's a survival of the fittest and the way it's really yeah like it the way it's built is all about survival of the fittest and even a prime example of it is the bragging rights of all the elite raid frames because you only can get one per season and the fact that they're already showcasing there's going to be a new map there's going to be new behemoths meaning these cool frames we've all got at the moment are only going to be limited for so many seasons so it's like again i can imagine zone one everyone's going to fight you get to get whatever if you you know if you're the alliance that gets the elite for raid frame you are but i feel like the strongest then go into zone two and then it's like they'll go into then the strongest fight again and then it'll go into zone three because that ultimately when you look at everything the, the elite dragon is almost a ziggurat at the end of the day right from rock like it is the the end goal for any of alliance that's especially in the top three power like you want ultimate bragging rights i control the flame dragon you fight me i can summon this big ass behemoth on your ass and cook you for breakfast right and i've got the sick frame that you don't have because i'm a beast like it's, it's just i think the way the game's set so even with the new changes like you said and the, and with all that i think it's still gonna be heavy pvp but instead of being pvp outwards it's going to be more like internal 
that makes sense. So if you start in Kaltia, it's going to be all the fighting early games going to be happening in Kaltia because you're going to be wanting to control whatever behemoths you can so you can push into zone two and be as strong as you can again and then move forward again. So we'll see how it moves, obviously, forward. But that's my my say on it. I think it. I like it. I don't know. I like the the ideology, I guess, of the game. <laughs> No, I got you. Okay, okay. No, man, always, always, always nice to hear. Uh, always nice to hear a different opinion. That is for sure. All right, let's do this. I know we're coming up now. I think to about uh, a little past thirty-five minutes. So let's yeah. let's do a little transition. Maybe we'll come back. But I want to talk a bit about migration, and specifically, we were chatting about this just before we started. And I, I do think there. So so I so I did a video talking about what my general fears are. Of migration based on its current based on the current system that is implemented because one you do not know how many players can join a kingdom before it caps you also don't have some type of early warning system to let you know before the kingdom gets full now you do have where it says busy i think it is or whatever yeah it's is like the traffic light system it's, it's active yeah so you you do have a, a color indicator but there's nothing that says, you know, like like an example. It would be cool if they gave you a number and they just showed you how many people were able to join the kingdom. Like we're not well, not even a total number of like how many people are in the kingdom total. But it'd be cool if it just showed you a. It actually would be cool if it showed you a plus minus. Like if it showed you the number of people that were coming in and the number of people that left. And it doesn't have to give names or anything, but just showing the number would be great because that would also allow for us to kind of gauge, you know, and maybe that number is different each season, depending on how often they open up migration. But just being able to show you that I think would be really helpful because the, the challenge right now is that we don't know what that number is. I mean, is it 50? Is it 150? Is it 300? We don't know what that is. But what's interesting is you have something on this because we were just talking about it for how SS1-2 played out with Kingdoms 1 through 6. And again, that's... And then also the other challenge is that there's no power There's no power restrictions. You could have 5 or 10 people that are 100 mil power going from one kingdom to another, right? Like, we don't know what the limitations are there, but theoretically that could happen. So I'm curious, though, uh, because I thought you brought some really good insight to this when we were talking before, right? So why don't, why don't you let us know how how did your situation play out with what you saw happening in SS1-2? Uh, yeah, so... It is a weird one because obviously our servers are a little bit of a outlier still because we've got six six servers to choose from, not 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 four. But uh, but apart from that, yeah, it is it's a weird one because like you said, you got the the traffic cone, as I say, the traffic light system, and that's the only thing you can work off. So us in SS one. Well, in, in TA, obviously, we were trying to figure out the best way of doing it, right? Um, yeah. Obviously, I am not part of the migration planning or all like that. I've said they've got their own team. People, I don't know who's in charge, but, you know, shout out to Ghost, Kagan, you you know, everyone, Ka Kawaii, everyone. Uh, they might be, you know, sorting out the migration plan. And basically, it ended up being on the lines of, obviously... If you guys don't know what my, how migration happens, obviously you get a window. So there's like a, a, it's almost like imagine a transfer window in the Premier League or you know the NFL. You know it's 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 roster time, boys. And uh, during this window, you've got like three or four days, it were to to obviously migrate. Um, the original plan was obviously to see where people moved because obviously you didn't know any sort of numbers right so what we were trying to do was see where almost the randoms would move to and by doing that you could hopefully see you know this this kingdom went from green to yellow then yellow to red hopefully and then what ended up happening were obviously they told everyone to wait and then would we would give you you know the server but a lot of players, including myself, just took upon ourselves, because I needed to obviously make videos on it. Um, I migrated myself straight into server two anyway, because that's where TA are from. Even if we were going to migrate into, say, server six or server five, wherever we were going to go, I still had the gems to do it, so I didn't care. But 
it was the fact that so many people did that already that mo it was almost like I don't know, it was a the most craziest I wouldn't say like piranha fest, but you, you can imagine it, it was just like reset happened, migration started, I migrate into server two, I feel like everything's normal in life, I fall asleep. Eight hours <laughs> later, server two's maxed out. Like there's no one can join server two anymore. Like and that was the reality. And what were happening were like in server two they were trying to contact other players that were in server two might might not have been playing as much or all and trying to get these guys to migrate out so they could get players in. But again, like you said, you you don't have an indicator. Like I, I and anyone who's looking in that situation couldn't say, oh, okay, we've made five spaces, five of you can come. You know, it was one of them things where and it was honestly disheartening to see where the the ending males, where it might have been the final, I don't know, it could be 10, 20, 30, maybe 50 members. I don't even know how many couldn't make it. But it was one of them things where they still haven't been able to migrate, so they're not in our server now, and now in the main alliance. And they've been told, like, look, hopefully next season, your server will be, ma you know, matched against us again. So then at the end of that season, hopefully you can migrate back into us. So it's one of them weird situations now where we've obviously got people what we wanted in, but obviously not everyone's there. So it is, I, I like the migration idea, but I, like you say, I, I think there needs a bit more execution to make it work. Like you say, a good indicator would be good. Or even if you went to migrate, right, and say it was full. This would, even I were thinking of this kind of like from my old WoW days. It's like, okay, the migration queue is, it, the, the server's full. I could still click migrate and be put into a queue. So it's just like your ticket is number 12. So you've got 11 mm. players in front of you. There, you know, once you get in line, you're in the kingdom, you know? So once you, at least you know then, and you can say to your officer, like, oh, look, I'm in position 13. So at least after 13 players leave your server, I'm going to be able to migrate into you, right? And it'd be a really good maybe system they could implement in or something like that. But yeah, it was a really weird time, I would say, for, for us. But we are at the end of it almost. Um, I think our reset happens not tomorrow but yeah well tomorrow reset so we've got i think like one day and like three hours from now so we're going to be live streaming it again so you can, guys can see that so it's going to be interesting we're going to see what I'll happens be, be tuned in on my scout <laughs> yeah. on my scout <laughs> um but no it should be good and i again i, th I think there's uh, just quite a few valid points there it's just and, and, and this is why I talk about the idea of having some type of king or queen system. And, and more specifically, just the interface, like those tools that you have for the kingdom mm -hmm. is to me so much better than any type of just common denominator type of approach that the developers can take because you need autonomy. Like, it's just, the fact is you need it. And you need to be able to say who can come into a kingdom and who cannot come into a kingdom. Only because the ramifications and the, and the probability of that is so, it can be so much more impactful than if you don't. And I'll give you a good example. Infinity Kingdom kind of tried to do this thing which was the best of both worlds, right? They did it where you didn't really have a king or queen, like in the traditional sense. You fought over, so they have this thing called the Forbidden Zone in the very yeah. middle. It's kind of like Zone 3. And uh, did you play Infinity Kingdom by chance? No, uh, no. Okay, so I'll get this super easy. There's five buildings in Zone 3. Once every few weeks, there would be this event. And in the event, it was kind of almost kind of like a, uh, uh, an MGE or an SLE type of event where you'd have a couple, you'd have each day would be a different stage. And then on stage three is when the buildings would start opening. Stage four is when the center building would open. And you basically, if you captured these, you would gain points. And those points would accumulate every hour. And then in the beginning stages, you would do things like killing PvE units in the middle, right? Or gathering. Or 
uh, training troops, like something that would go towards an accumulative total that you would get points for that would be proportioned based on the stage. And then all those points by the end of the, by the end of this event would add up and whoever had the most points and that were over 200,000 or something like that would win the event. And if you won the event, then your alliance had control of the forbidden zone for a week or two weeks or something like that. And then it would refresh and you do it all again. And I, I actually I actually liked this approach, not to say that I would maybe favor it over everything else, but I liked it because I felt like it, it found a happy middle ground. It wasn't just, here's the Lost Temple in Rock, you cap it, and then you have it until the next rotation. In IK, they made an event out of it where everyone would participate in a way that was not them fighting over one single structure. And then whoever won that event basically became king or queen for that, for that period of time. Yeah. It'd so be I cool. liked it. Sorry. Go, go, go. Sorry. No, no, no. Yeah, you're good. I was going to say, it'd be cool if they could do something like that. Like, I could imagine yeah. maybe in a season, if they did, instead of, like, the flame dragon, um, imagine you still had, like, a big zone, and you had, like, a world boss in there. It was just free-roaming yeah. world boss. And during an event, it was down to damage. So, like, the most damage dealt by an alliance, like, occupied that area. Yeah. And if you occupied that area, what I was suggesting, instead of, like, a king or a queen, it could still be, like, almost a democracy, right? So, like, someone who wants to migrate into the kingdom would go through the democracy of the... Obviously, the number one alliance obviously gets to dictate by controlling the world boss. But um, you would say, okay, this person's coming in. The R5 and all the officers get to pick green or red, you know, make it a fair choice. And if, if it's a, you know, 50-50, it's obviously a no. But if there's a majority 60-40 split or something, then that guy gets, you know, migrated in. So at least it's not just dictated by one person. So then, you know, you're not fearing, for example, I don't know, you know, Nefesto, for example, you know, like just say, yep, this guy's in, this guy's in, this guy's in. Nope, you're not, you're not, you know. So it could do something like that where, you know, you could do that IK system where you would make like an event world boss in zone three that does appear. And then if you control that world boss, you have rights to the migration at the end of the season or something. It'd be really cool because obviously it gives you, Alliance is a reason to fight for that end game reward, right? As well. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think the way that it, so IK was a little bit it was it was a somewhat similar. Like they had power caps at, I think it was like seven a million and like one point five and then two million or something like that. But you know, my view on it is always having having that level of autonomy allows for you to avoid have a higher percentage chance of avoiding the worst case scenario, because currently right now there is no power cap. So you could have, I mean, theoretically, you could have a group of spenders or whales that just want to hop from kingdom to kingdom and just cause havoc and just go in and attack everyone. And then the next season, they do the same thing. Like, I've seen this in IK, and I'm, I'm sure they probably might, might have someone rock, but I, I know at least of two groups that were in Infinity Kingdom that every month when the cooldown hit, they would migrate to another kingdom and they would just make sure that it's healthy. There's a lot of targets. And they would just go nom, nom, nom. they just go to town, man. Just eat everyone up. Mm. And uh, again, I'm not saying that that's going to be something that's going to be widespread. We do have to have some realistic expectations. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that if you do not have a level of autonomy where you can tell someone yes or no, that should not... Think about it like this, right? They, they talk about... That being, and they've said this before, right? Kind of being something that they, they, they're not looking at. But what you have to understand is that if that person doesn't get into your kingdom, they'll probably get into another kingdom. It's not like they're never going to be accepted by anyone, right? They're, they're arguing it could be a kingdom for everyone. But yeah. my, point, my point, right? Like, I mean, in Infinity Kingdom, we had that. Like, Kingdom 5 was known as the War Kingdom. So in that kingdom, all they did which is PvP all day, every day, dude. It was a battle royale 24 7, like 7 Eleven. <laughs> and, and, and what's funny is, dude, they marketed themselves this way. Yeah, like man. they would promote in recruitment and they would say, look, you want to come and test your battle in the best war server Call around where all we do is fight nonstop? Yeah. And, yeah. and people would go there. 
It makes um, sense because I I like it because it's <laughs> it's a weird. It's a very WoW philosopher again because in WoW, if everyone's played World of Warcraft, in all the servers are split up like that. You have servers dedicated to PVE content only, so you can just go through PVE. There's PVEVP, which is the same where you can do all of it, and then there's literally a pure PVP world where no matter where you are, you are able to be killed. And there's even yeah. role playing, you know, servers. There's all these different type of servers allowed, and each of them have their own, you know, population, and they all live, you know, the way they do. So it'd be cool if COD did again something like that, and like as you say, like an IK. It's it's a cool concept because then you can have like you know, this is server is for this, and then you go mm -hmm. there when you event, you know, obviously. The migration system at the moment doesn't work for that because obviously the current migration yeah. system's designed so you know you can migrate to the guys you currently fight against and in case you know maybe you haven't been getting on with your current seat server and then you found some new friends yeah. and a new server it allows you to keep but, playing so ch so check this out the easiest way to do migration is this you allow for players to go anywhere they want to go to absolutely no restrictions as far as on uh, server age but you just make it autonomous. You make it so that way pl the king or queen can control and set the power cap, yeah. right? If you do it that way, it doesn't matter at that point because that kingdom is taking the risk based on who they accept or who they deny. So if you think about it, A, the, the age of a server at that point doesn't matter, yeah, right? It's now, the responsibility uh, of the owner, isn't it? exactly they're accountable for that and then before they go in and then you think about it okay well then the question becomes okay well what happens boss if if uh, a, a group goes into a brand new kingdom and then they just want to bring in all their mains and wreck face well here's the answer for that you do some type of elo rating system very similar to what they were doing in rock where you put the kingdoms up against the other kingdoms that would be the top five kingdoms in the game and the number six through ten. I mean, there's way, the, my, the point is there's ways to mitigate that where you can create the most simplistic system ever when it comes to migration without having to have all these hoops that you have to jump through or these. I mean, look at how crazy rock migration is, right? How many, how many people do we know or do you think have a perfect understanding of how to do rock migration for every season until you get to season of conquest. Like probably not everyone, because it's just very convoluted. But if you simply if you if you tone it down and strip it away and you say, look, anyone can go anywhere, we'll have a king or we'll, we'll have something in place where someone can set whatever the cap is for when the migration window opens, right? Bait whether it's a king or queen type system, if it's all these alliances fighting over for control of it, right? Whatever it may be. But then you make it so they can set it. So if they want to accept someone as a brand new kingdom that's stronger than anyone else there, and they don't know that person, that's the risk they're going to take, and and that should be account, and they should be accountable for that. Treating your kingdom as though it is a kingdom, right? Regardless of who's running, you can have kingdoms where you have multiple factions. I mean, geez, just look at Game of Thrones as a prime example. You got yeah. a kingdom, but you got multiple factions that are within that are within your continent. Uh, and, and at times within your actual kingdom or the country itself. So, you know, it, I don't know. My view on it is like, let's, let's do a less is more. Let's do a, let, you know, let's do a, let's work smarter, not harder. Because right now you're, you're almost having to work a little harder because you don't know these things and you don't know who's going to come into your kingdom and you don't know what their intentions are. But if you have some type of a vetting process, you can at least mitigate some of that. So anyways, again, that's my view on it. That's how I'd like to see it. But yeah, no, I, I understand where, where they're at right now. They're trying to have it be fair for everyone and probably not trying to put a lot of restrictions on it like we're seeing now. I, I just think that can be really detrimental. Yeah, no, I get you. I do. I would like it because, like I say, I, I won't even lie. I'd like themed servers. I do think themed servers is kind of like a, weirdly a good thing. That's why even anyone coming from any sort of background, even a shooter, some people used to play Battlefield Two, Call of Duty Four, World of War. You guys know the best thing that was in those games were server list <laughs> and now <clears throat> server list doesn't exist it's all about hit find match and we will put you in the right game and it's like oh yeah. you know but like i'd love some sort of servers of obviously kingdoms that are all their own unique maybe a personalities because 
I can sure. imagine it, man. And I was speaking to one of my best mates who's playing the game about it. I was like, hey, could you imagine just like a kingdom after like, say, a year or two of playing and they were mellowed out, but the whole kingdom's premise was just mercenaries to hire. So the whole server would go into a division yeah. and, you know, you know you're against three other servers, but one of the servers knows your mercenaries to hire. So they're like, do you know what? We're going to pay your alliance, uh, main alliances, this amount of resource per week to fight on our behalf. And then you're like, yeah, all right, <laughs> then we're going to fight on your so, behalf. And you just played the so, role-playing game of a mercenary, dude. I'd love to see that's that. That's so funny. Yeah, yeah, where they're just, they're like weekly maxing you out. Oh, I'd love it. At your, I'd be at like, your weekly yeah, cap. man, you, pay, you yeah. pay for my hospital bill and I will fight for you all day, son. <laughs> like, I would love yeah. to see that type of stuff. But yeah, you know, it, it's obviously obviously dreamworks and that but it would be very yeah. fun to see for for the game I, I would hope in the future no no for sure i mean even if you know would be really cool is if they even allowed for kingdoms to choose uh like where you could lock it in like so like they gave you kv like they gave you just the kvk group shell and then kingdoms could coordinate and say all right hey we want to fight you guys in kvk so then they load up into this uh, into this group, and then another kingdom loads up into the group, and kingdoms could even choose which other kingdoms they want to go and fight against. Oh, and then yeah. you see the historical record there, and you could see, okay, well, which kingdoms are, because you have to think about it. That would tell a lot about your kingdom if you're taking the hard road or the easy road, yeah. right? Especially depending on what you're doing. And, I, and I'm just saying, generally speaking, that would be cool if something like that could happen. Where because in rock. There is some type of thing where you can almost kind of do something like that, where you guys kind of go into the same, I believe it's like season story mode, uh, or which season, like KVK season you want to go into for, for its storyline. But if you have the opportunity to literally go in and say, we're Kingdom 70, we want to match up with these other kingdoms, you do something where maybe you create like a private group or something like that. And then once you get five kingdoms or six kingdoms or whatever, then like you, you have a you have a time window, right? Obviously, it yeah. has to stay on pace with what the game's uh, uh, back end is on. But then let's say you're given three days to basically get a KVK group together. You could have kingdoms that say, look, we five want to go in and fight each other. And just have like an all out war or you could, or as another example, you could do the same thing, but you could have kingdom say, look, we're going to do it. No rush style, right? We're talking like back traditional RTS stuff. We're going to say, we're not going to fight anyone in zone one. No one in zone two. Everyone's going to build. We'll have equal splits all the way to zone three. Once everyone connects to the dragon, then we're going to have all out war in zone three. Let's see who we'll disconnects. <laughs> Yeah, no, 100%. Like, just, yeah, like, we'll have all our wars. Like, But the point is you give everyone the opportunity to build all the way, and then you do the big fight, and you say, we're going to do all out war in Zone 3 and uh, until until there's only one alliance left or something like that that still has territory in Zone 3. And if you lose all your territory from your gate or something like that, then you're out. You have to wait until the fight finishes. You could even do something where you say, uh, Zone 1 is safe, once everyone connects to zone three, then it's an all out fight all the way through zone two. Like, I mean, the point is you can do things like that. If you have like minded kingdoms and people that are, are running those, whoever it is, if it's one alliance or a group, you can do those types of fun things. And, uh, but anyways, I, again, I'm, I'm kind of going off on my, you know, enjoyable long term <laughs> wishful tangents here at this point. But I think we've kind of beaten the horse, if we will. I think we're coming up to about an hour. Uh, unless there was something else maybe you wanted to add in. No, no, I think we've covered okay. everything. I hope everyone's enjoyed the episode. All right. Awesome. Well, that's going to be it for us, guys. This is the Cod Pod episode eight with myself and Mr. Sneaky. Uh, Sneak, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell the boys and gals out there in the world where they can find you, what you got coming up next, and then I'll close this out. Yeah, um, so you can catch me out on YouTube, Mr. Sneak, obviously, um, as the overlay show for both of us. Um, also, I'm live streaming now, so I'm going to be trying to live stream every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, which is a nice little schedule. Um, and upcoming content-wise, to be fair, a lot of people have been asking, and it, it's very draining, and you'll probably get the same questions, but it's like, which commander is better with what commander? Well, there's a four-part series coming out for each of the unit types, so if you're wanting to learn about mages, archers, cavalry, infantry, 
I'm going to tell you from start to finish how to pair your commanders and work with what you've got all the way through. So that's what I've got coming up. So I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Thanks for having me. Or say thanks for having me. Thanks for listening, everyone. But until the next one, I'll pass it back to you. I'm good now. All right, man. No, no, love it. Love it. That is, I'm sure it's going to be a hot one. Uh, for me, as always, you guys can find me at, at Boss Nasty. And yeah, I mean that that's pretty much it. I'm I'm pretty simple. So I got one thing right now and that's what I'm uh that's what I'm sticking with. So it's the uh, the you know, the old man maneuvers, if you will. Uh as always, hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Can't wait for more to come. Hopefully we might even have a chance to get some some more guests coming on in the future. But otherwise it's always a pleasure, sneak. And uh, to everyone out there, again, hope you guys enjoyed. Let us know what you think in the comments down below. And as always, until next time, we will catch you later. <laughs>